In 1949, Franz Liszt began composing an Italian opera. It was central to his ambition to attain status as a great European composer alongside Rossini, Meyerbeer, and the young Wagner. But he abandoned it halfway through, and the music he completed has lain silently in an archive for nearly 170 years. This project is about bringing it to life for the very first time. The manuscript for Liszt's opera had been catalogued in the early 20th century by Peter Raben, so it was a known entity. I became aware of it while studying in Leipzig. So I got on the train to the archive in Weimar. I was expecting to find uh, some fragmentary sketches and incoherent uh, beginnings of musical ideas. By chance, the first item I looked at was the beginning of a beautiful aria for soprano. I listened to this in my head and transcribed as much as I could, and in fact, I couldn't get it out of my head for the rest of the next week. That was the moment that I decided the music needed to be rescued. The only source is a single manuscript of 111 pages, written for piano and voices. It was always assumed to be fragmentary and partially illegible. When I had the chance to study it in detail, however, it became clear the music flows as part of a continuous fabric. What this notated was essentially a composition draft for Act I that was to be orchestrated by his assistant, Joachim Raff. Analytically speaking, it's complete. The cardinal elements of harmony, rhythm, counterpoint, melody, and texture are all present. When you reflect that an entire act has been waiting there silently for so long, it's quite a moving idea. The music is not always written idiomatically for piano. You have to think through the artistic decisions traceable in the manuscript and try to reconstruct the creative process to see how Liszt's mind went this way and that. Should you have uh, semiquaver or triplet accompaniments, render the theme in 3-4 or in 4-4, have a grand cadential ornament or a simple cadence, omit this passage or retain it. This kind of work, of uh, reliving the compositional process, affords you a knowledge that uh, of working practice that I don't think is obtainable in any other way. It's been a fascinating journey. Some parts of the score are written clearly and fluently. Uh, here, in the central duet between Mira and Sardanapolo, you can see that Mira talks of her misery to a rising chromatic sequence, and uh, the music is really very clear on the page. You can see exactly what Liszt intended. to look carefully at the various deletions that Liszt inserts into the score. Here, in Beleza's opening speech, Liszt cuts out quite a number of bars going over the page before the word prestan is clearly written and the line continues. But immediately before then, we have a quaver upbeat, and we need this quaver upbeat for the complete word a prestan. So you have to be careful to catch the continuity of the score. If you look at the moment that Belezo summons the spirit of the ancient kings of Assyria, you can see that Liszt changes the meter from 3-4 to common time. When he writes above the score, you can just see zwei takte in einem. So two bars are to be conflated into one. This means that uh, the, music, the written music changes from something like this. something a little bit more like this. Uh, 
And of course, the question arises, which version should we use? Which should be included in the edition? Which did Liszt intend? If you look further forward, you can see precisely the same material is used for the king when he reflects on uh, the terror of war. And here, it's in common time. For that reason, we accept the revision and also interpret the earlier version in common time. where Liszt simply leaves out parts of the accompaniment. Here, you can see the start of a grand orchestral march. The king's line is clear enough. He sings throughout the march, and we have all the notes, the rhythms, the phrasing, the text, so it's clear. The accompaniment, however, begins clearly, but then we have only bass notes. And over the page, even the bass notes drop out. We have nothing for a few bars before the bass notes come back. Now, if you interpret this to mean that Liszt uh, wanted the accompanimental pattern to continue, then we can simply continue the pattern and deduce the harmony either from the bass notes as given and when they're absent from the vocal parts. Uh, and in that case, uh, we can retrieve the whole musical conception. is an ideal place to undertake this kind of work uh, is its sheer concentration of musical expertise. One of the biggest challenges of the project was deciphering the text underlay in Liszt's manuscript. This is the only source for the opera's libretto without which the music would be totally unperformable. So I was delighted when Francesca Vella and David Rosen agreed to collaborate to produce an edition of this text and a translation. One of the most exciting moments early on was when Francesca uh, first sent me a draft of the opening chorus. When I saw this, I knew that it would be possible to keep going. It confirmed that not only was the text decipherable for the most part, but that it formed a complete coherent narrative. That was an exciting moment. When David approached me about this project a few months ago, um, he said there was this abandoned Italian opera by Liszt that had been firmly off the radar, but that contained some beautiful music. He asked me whether I could transcribe and in a few places um, reconstitute it dramatically at the libretto. I have to say, when I first saw Liszt's scribblings, and knowing that there would be over a hundred of such pages to go through, I felt inclined to say no. Liszt didn't know Italian well, so the text is full of spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, and false accents, and interpolation of words, probably by Liszt himself, uh, that rendered the lines symmetrical and so on. Now, the reason why I decided in the end um, to give it a go is that um, the project seemed to offer a rare opportunity um, of putting myself into the mind of a 19th century librettist uh, or composer and experience some of the dynamics that lie behind the composition of an opera um, from inside out, if you like. Now, as I delved into the manuscript, I realized that actually um, there are relatively few occasions when the text can't be deciphered or, or inferred in some way. As you get used to listening writing, and as you familiarize yourself with the context of the opera and with the characters, and as you start to spot words or lines that are repeated uh, one or more times, um, you can actually get a good deal of what is written or, or even uh, what is absent. But the fact is that um, this only happens as you progress. 
So in a first run through the manuscript, or, e or even in a second and third run, you only write down w what, w what you had deciphered or what you think you've deciphered. And then gradually you start to refine and recover further layers of the text and also to add um, any material which is still needed to make syntactic sense and to fit the existing music. This process means that you are constantly moving back and forth, um, constantly redefining the meaning of what is on the page. It also means that this meaning emerges not so much uh, from the single snapshot, so from paying particular attention to a specific detail, but also from um, the refraction of that detail through a larger picture. Some cues also came uh, from rehearsing this music with performers, um, particularly uh, when we were undecided about the interplay uh, between words and music. The whole editing process really returns you to a kind of practice-based, collaborative type of work, which I think really gives you the flavour of what composing a 19th century opera might have been like. One other interesting thing that struck me um, is the tension between the authority that you are projecting by making particular editorial decisions and the frailty of the text in this manuscript. The more you try to do justice um, in the critical apparatus of the edition um, to every single thing that Liz writes and also to all the little corrections and adjustments that we had to make to the text, the more you end up creating something which actually uh, becomes removed from the nature of Liz's autograph. Now I think this kind of experience and also this kind of paradoxes to some extent are typical of any editorial projects. But the fact that here we are working with a source that demands um, that the text be refashioned substantially in a variety of ways makes that tension all the more significant and also all the more interesting, I think. I was naturally intrigued by the project, what would Liszt do with an Italian operatic libretto? And also, I thought it would be fun, exciting even, to translate poetry that no one had ever read, poetry for an opera that no one had ever heard, and an added mystery, the librettist was anonymous. We think that he was an Italian who had been imprisoned by the Austrians for political activity, and at that time was an exile in Paris. I suspect that he was a letterato, a literary man. Perhaps he had even written some plays, but he was not conversant with all of the conventions of Italian opera. There are moments, however, when the librettist follows the conventions, but Liszt chooses to disregard them. When the librettist provides rhyming, scanning, symmetrical verse suitable for lyrical, vocal display, instead Liszt chooses to give the orchestra the, the main thematic material, relegating the, the vocal part to declamation. Operas are bitextual, 
by which I mean that there is the text that the audience would hear in the theater, the text that Liszt set to music and that we present in our edition of the score. There's also the text that the audience would read and that would be similar to the libretto that had been consigned by the librettist to Liszt to be set to music and that would appear in a printed libretto had Liszt completed the opera and it had, been, had it been performed, a printed libretto that would be read by the, by the audience. Since the only source of that original libretto is Liszt's autograph, we've had to reconstruct it. We have also eliminated or at least identified those interpolations like ah, see, ah, those ahs and yeses and so on and so on, as well as identifying those repetitions of lines of poetry, whether partial or complete repetitions. Here's an example. The character Beleso, some sort of religious or elder statesman, uh, implores Sardanapalus to give up his life of luxury and, and uh, uh, go off to war. Lascial fuso, impugnil brando, uh, set aside your, your womanish spindle, uh, spinning spindle, and, uh, and take up the sword. That line comes back moments, minutes later, against uh, a lyrical melody of the soprano, Mira, and we have to decide whether it's part of the original libretto, part of the libretto that the audience would have read in, in the printed libretto, uh, or whether it's a list interpolation. Now, it's an outlier. It breaks a pattern, a pattern of pairs of five line stanzas given to each of the three characters. It doesn't fit in. And therefore, we decided that it was a, an interpolation by list, and we distinguish it typographically. We put it in italics. My translation is a prose translation, not intended to be sung. I've tried to capture the literal sense of the words, but also to preserve something of the high, poetic, elevated linguistic register. Let's return to that line of Beleso. Lascio fuso in punil brando. Fuso is a spindle or stick upon which threads or fibers are, are, are wound. Hence, women's work, and that, of course, is the point of Beleso's insult to Sardanapulus. Byron, however, uses the synonym distaff, uh, and I've therefore chosen to use it. Uh, however, since it's a rather esoteric word, I've glossed it in a footnote. Lascia fuso, lascia leave. But leave is vanilla, rather bland, and cast aside is too vigorous, so I've chosen set aside. Uh, now, impugna, take up, well, impugna, impugnare, has the sense of combat, as in English, pugnacious, and also fist is in there, pugno. Grasp, seize, grab. I chose grasp because it's of the higher poetic level that I, that I wanted, that I, th that I think is there, as opposed to the lower level, uh, indeed, Trumpian grab, and I also thought that grasp better reflected the action of the hand. Brando is also more poetic at a higher level than the normal everyday word for sword, spada, if one can talk about normal everyday words for sword, but I couldn't find a high level poetic equivalent in English. If I use blade, I have grasped the blade, ouch. The end result then is set aside the distaff, grasp the sword. So I hope that this gives some sense of the trials and tribulations of a translator of Italian opera. Throughout the process, I've worked with three very talented singers it's been a genuinely symbiotic relationship, not only to explore the music together as real sound, but also to try out tempos, articulation, cadential ornamentation, see how it fits in the voice, uh, and so on. This left very few tempo markings and almost no articulation, so working together and exploring the musical interpretation uh, has been quite invaluable.
it's just so unique the way he makes the turns or the way he changes the harmonies in the place that the vocal line was asking for a more for a different logical solution somehow for for example there were lines that you think as a singer oh that's definitely the progression is going to be that way and Liszt gives you something different something completely um, unimaginable for that point something that that as a singer you wouldn't probably expect but it works amazingly well it, it feels like a blend between sort of a Wagnerian tessitura but this very high bel canto which is reminiscent of the Meyerbeer forms um, but obviously with this amazing list flavor that um, is so pervasive within the piece He's a good dramaturg, uh, that's for sure, um, and he knows how to he knows how to make you how to hook you into the story. He knows how to interest you. He knows how to creep in your mind and make you believe what's going on on the stage. And this is why it's just such a pity that that wasn't anyone before that thought of editing this because it's just a gem. It's pure gem from the beginning until the end. When we started this project, I don't think any of us really were quite certain what was going to be coming from it. And uh, I had quite a long chat with David about, uh, about the peace and about life and about uh, ourselves. And um, it really was the start of what became a, a, an ensemble, a little list group. I would say it's extraordinary to be involved in this uh, production and to be part of the be part of this unsung opera and where you can bring something from yourself, where you are free from the patterns because you never heard other singers singing the role. So there is more freedom. And uh, I would say we have a really great team and we work together and try to, try to suggest some ideas, some parts, how it would be uh, more interesting or find another color. There have been a number of uh, updates which have been slightly frustrating. Um, when it comes to changing uh, text or uh, in particular parts of the voice where it sits, uh, but it's not ever been a, ch a terrible challenge. Um, and it's been a real labor of love, I think, for all of us. Somebody actually said to me uh, on one of the first occasions that we uh, performed a, a, an excerpt of it about how does it feel to not have any materials to listen to in preparing it. And I, I just replied, well, I take great solace in knowing that anybody who does prepare it from now on will be listening to me. So, yeah. It's a really big honor for me. And uh, I don't know how to describe it. As I said, it's really a unique opportunity. And probably uh, now I'm in a process of production and now I'm not sure, I, I can't explain with the words. Probably afterwards I will feel the importance of this project and um, my involvement in this uh, project. We are very looking forward for continuing and to see overall what it will become. Who else ever gets to uh, premiere uh, uh, a new opera by a superstar composer from two centuries ago? I mean, that's, that's just amazing. That's great. <laughs> that's that's once-in-a-life opportunity for sure. It's um, and the entire process of making it um, work, uh, thinking about the character, thinking about the plot, thinking what would Liszt want here and how would he hear that and how would he want this character react or this character bring the emotions to the, to the stage. It's just, it's, it's such a wonderfully deep, uh, deeply creative and deeply imaginative work, which uh, I'm really am blessed to have this 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 project, and I'm blessed to be working with David. <laughs> Well,
we'll never know exactly why Liszt abandoned the opera, but I think there are two main factors to consider. His growing passion for Wagner and his aesthetic direction, and also the practical matter of revisions to his libretto. Early on, Liszt requested that the opera scenario be conflated from three acts into two. And over a number of years, he made a number of requests for changes to the second act. In the end, I think it simply came down to the fact that he never received a revised version of the libretto for act two. The opera clearly meant a great deal to him at the time, and I think it's telling that he neither destroyed the manuscript nor recycled any of its contents. I suspect he would have been surprised to learn that it's resurfacing in the 21st century, but I'd like to think that he would have smiled on it.